recording. Okay, there we go. All right, so uh, welcome to our third lab for the semester. Um, as per usual, I, I put a little bit, of, I put a handout um, or I wrote up a little um, summary of what we're going to do today and I posted that on the course website yesterday. So the purpose of today's lab is to implement the iterated iterative weighted least squares approach that we um, derove by hand in lecture set number three. So this is the data that we're going to be working with. It's just this little toy data set where we have different values of y stacked at the same value of x. And we're going to assume that we can model y using a Poisson distribution and that um, the relationship between the mean of y and x can be modeled using uh, the linear model given or the equation given here, right? Where beta is uh, composed of an intercept, which we're calling beta one. This could also be beta zero and beta two, which would be the slope. And then X is going to be a matrix of one and XI. All right. So we, um, before we in introduce this example in lecture, we work through the process of deriving the components of the iterative least square iterative least squares procedure. So just very briefly, because we all have this and we can review it whenever, but the idea basically is that we want to compute these two matrices, X transpose WX and X transpose WZ, where Z is given by the expression shown above and W is given by the expression shown on slide 18. Uh, well, the diagonal elements of W are given by the expression shown on slide 18. And we're going to estimate beta K by taking the inverse of this matrix, X transpose WX, and multiplying it by X transpose WZ. So the um, process of performing this particular uh, parameter estimation scheme is going to require, among other things, matrix, oper matrix operations and the ability to take the inverse of matrices. So things in R that we can do very easily. So matrix operations, as you're going to see, there's just a built-in command for running that. Um, one of the interesting things that this will uh, reveal is how sensitive R can be to matrix specification and how you have to load the matrix in a certain way. Um, this is something that, or an issue that you, I've run into a lot of times. You know, you end up trying to multiply vectors by matrices, and that gives you an error. And then there's little tricks that you can do to set up the matrices, like transpose, transpose is a popular trick, though it is technically computationally inefficient. Anyways, we're going to go through illustrations of how to set up the matrix and run matrix, matrix multiplication today. And then we will also, I'll show you one of the ways that you can find the, in, the, the inverse of a matrix, which again is just done through built-in functions like solve or um, I think there's like a gimp function that will find the inverse as well. All right, so on slide 21, uh, we drove the form of RWI uh, diagonal elements for this particular model. And then we drove the form of the ZI vector for this particular model. And then we put those things together to show what X transpose XW and X, trans X transpose X, X transpose WX and X transpose WZ look like, which are these, this two by two matrix here and this vector, uh, this two by one vector shown here. So this is actually the hardest part, in my opinion, because the derivation of the matrices is, is once we have these, we're literally just coding um, these matrices into R directly. So given that we have these four elements here, our goal will be to implement uh, this matrix in R by just directly coding these four um, entries of the matrix and implementing this vector into R by coding this entry and this entry into a, a, a vector and then putting those all together. So that's effectively what we're gonna do today is just code this matrix and this matrix, put it inside of a for loop because it is sort of a newton raphson style algorithm. And then we're gonna iterate and update beta based off of those components. All right, so I have mentioned that the data set we're going to be using is this artificial toy data set shown here. This data set is actually available in the R package Dobson. So if you install Dobson, which I've already done on my machine, so I'm not gonna do it again. And then you uh, load Dobson 
And then you can run, and then the data set, this toy data set is just called Poisson. So you can visualize the data by typing in Poisson, and then we can um, plot the data by typing in Poisson x, Poisson y, x lab equals x, y lab equals y, main equals y versus x. So you can see this is the data that we're working with. I'll just elongate this plot momentarily just so we can get a better look at it. And you can see we have three different values for X. We have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different values for Y. The values of Y are stacked at each point of X. And we're going to try and fit this regression line through this data, uh, making the assumption that the response variable is a Poisson random variable. Right. Okay, and then I'll, I won't, I'm not going to label the Poisson or the plot because I think it's obvious what these commands are doing. Okay. So we are going to implement the IWLS process from lecture set three. Okay, so we're going to build on our discussion of custom R functions from last class, so or from last lab. So last week, I introduced the R function function, and um, I showed how we can use that function to code up our own um, methodologies, and then we can run those functions for different numbers of iterations or for different starting points, and we can um, evaluate the performance of the function. Or, and then, well, we can evaluate the performance of the function, and we can also retrieve in our situation parameter estimates for the regression models that we're working with. All right, so I mentioned that the, um, the background work for this particular procedure was done in lecture set three. So, really, all we're doing here is we are implementing the work from that particular lecture set. So, I'm going to build a function that I'm going to call IWS dot poise can't type today right this is going to be a function of the data set of interest of uh beta hat zero so this is going to be my starting point and i'm gonna call i'm gonna set this to be seven five so those are the values for beta one and beta two um, that we use to initialize the procedure when we wrote out the first step in our lecture in lecture set number three and then I'm going to set a default number of iterations for the process to be five. Right. Okay, now I'm going to extract X and Y from the data set of interest. Then I'm going to create a matrix where I'm going to store the beta hat values. There are many different ways that you can do this. The reason I'm going to put it into a matrix is because I want to show you at the end how the iter how the uh, values update across each of the iterations. So this matrix is going to start off as a matrix of NAs. So the first entry, the first entry here is saying create a matrix that's full of NAs. And then what I'm going to do is specify the number of rows. So I'm going to use two rows and I'm going to use iter number of columns. Okay, so this is going to be a two by number of iteration column where each column gives the updates for beta on each successive iteration. So my first entry in beta, beta hat is going to be the starting point. So basically the way that this is going to work is that the first column is like, is, is the first, or the first column is going to be iteration zero. So the first column is going to contain the, the starting point for beta hat. Now I'm going to open a for loop. So we talked about the definition of the for loop last time. And this is going to run from two to the number of iterations. 
All right, now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to build those X transpose W X matrices and the X transpose W Z matrix. So I'm gonna have X transpose W X is going to be, and the way that I'm gonna set this up is I'm gonna put it into a vector and then I'm gonna transform it into a matrix. You can put it into the matrix directly if you want, but it's just a little cleaner uh, to write it this way because the formula are fairly involved. Okay, so all I'm doing here is I'm coding in directly these four elements from lecture set number three. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is code, uh, or I'm going to write a line of code that would compute this sum. So I'm going to have sum one over beta dot hat one from the previous iteration plus beta dot hat two. So this first one here, or I'll, I'll explain this momentarily. So what's happening here is beta dot hat is a matrix. So this is saying, take the first element or take the first row and the I minus I minus minus oneth <laughs> I minus oneth column of that matrix. So this is basically saying take beta one on the previous iteration, add beta two plus from the previous iteration. Okay, and this is gonna get multiplied by X, right? Cause we have the XI there. And that's the first element. So the only part of this that I think is really tricky is understanding how we're subsetting the matrix. So when we want to subset matrices, it's sort of like subsetting a vector. We use square brackets and then inside the square bracket, we indicate the row and the column that we want to work with. Okay. I'm going to do a similar thing for the second part. So here I'm going to have the sum and this time I'll have the same denominator but I'll just be dividing by, uh, or I'll just be dividing X by that denominator, right? And then this is gonna get repeated again as my third element. So we can see from the lecture slide that these two elements are the same. And then this is going to get repeated again, except that we're gonna have a square term here. All right, and now what I'm going to do is transform this into a vector or into a matrix rather um, so that I can perform the matrix calculations that I need uh, to update the beta. Any questions so far? All right, so now we're going to code up the X transpose W Z or vector, which is this vector here. Pretty much the exact same idea as what we just saw, except we're going to have a Y I here, X I Y I here. So we can take one of the elements from above. This is going to become Y. And we can put the same element down here, and this is going to be X times Y. Okay, and then we can turn this into a matrix. Okay.
right? And now what we can do is we can, um, now that we have these two matrices coded up, we can finish the example off by updating beta. So we're gonna go beta on iteration i, so on the ith iteration, is going to be the inverse of x transpose dot wx multiplied. So this is the matrix multiplication command in R by x transpose dot w dot z. And that's pretty much it. So at the end of this, we can return the beta dot hat matrix. And before we return the matrix, we can customize that matrix a bit. So we can say call names beta dot hat is going to be the iteration number. So this is going to be one to iter minus one. Can I go? Okay, so this is going to be from zero to iter minus one. Sep equals space. And then we can say row names, beta dot hat goes to paste beta hat. And this will be one to sep equals space. All right, so let's see if this, oh, and then we have to put in our data set. So data is equal to Poisson. Um, the beta dot hat is defaulted and so is the iteration number. So we can leave this alone. Okay, and obviously I made a mistake somewhere. So one of these, it doesn't like one of these two. It's probably the zero to iter thing it doesn't like. Yeah, there we go. All right, so uh, just zoom out a little bit here. Okay, so let's run this. And here are the results. So you can see that on iteration zero, we started the algorithm with beta hat one is seven, beta hat two is five. Then on iteration number one, we have 7.45, 4.93. Then we have 7.4516, 4.935, 7.4516, 3, 4.9353, and then the same value. So you can see that after four iterations, we're converging to a solution in terms of uh, lack of change in the parameter estimates. So it takes about, it doesn't take very long for us to get there, which isn't surprising given the size of the data set. So what we can do now is we can actually just um, evaluate this line using the plot command. Okay, so we have the following, All right? So then we're gonna take our plot from before, and then we're gonna ab line a equals res one five. So this is basically just saying take from, so save the IWLS process as res, and then pull from res the 
value of beta on the fifth iteration, beta one on the fifth iteration, and the value of beta two on the fifth iteration. Right, so if we do this, we have the following. So here we can see our superimposed regression line, which, um, so in terms of the, the fitted values, okay, so, That's interesting. It's not exactly what you would expect, but. Sorry, one sec. There's a way to, uh... ah. Just wanna check out something here. Oh yeah, that makes sense. So you can see here's the intercept. So this horizontal line here represents the, the Y intercept. So 7.45, you can see that that's crossing right where X equals zero, which is what you would expect. Cause that's the definition of the Y intercept but I just wanted to confirm it. So you can see at X equals zero, the value of Y is 7.45163. The slope of this line is 4.935. And the line does appear to go uh, basically right through the middle of these points. So it seems like it's it's taking the average of the points effectively. But one of the drawbacks here is it, we're, we're only going to get one estimate for each of the different values of X, where we can see that there are the four stack points, but there's not much you can do about that. That's one of the drawbacks of the, of the procedure or of um, fitting a regression line to stack values, rather. Cool. All right, um, we can also check, or sorry, any questions? <sighs> Man, always asking the tough questions. Well, I guess it depends on the question that you want to answer. If we're interested in predicting the value of Y given the value of X, then this would be the most reasonable way of going about that because that's the point of regression. If you're interested in, for example, trying to determine if there's a difference between say like the average value at each of the different points, you could treat these values as categories and turn this into an ANOVA. Um, but those are the first two things that come to mind. I think it just depends on what you're trying to do, but uh, we'll, We haven't gotten to, so in lecture set number four, we're still talking about model evaluation. Specifically, we're about to get to the part where we start talking about deviance. Now that we have the, uh, we under, we've, der we've derived the sampling distribution of the MLEs. And um, if you are interested in prediction, even though we run into that issue where we're gonna be basically predicting the same value for each value of X, we could still, argue that this line fits the data well if the deviance measure, for example, um, doesn't suggest that we need to use the maximal model. 
that's sort of an aside to answer your question it, it depends to, to answer the question what would be the best way it depends on the question you are trying to answer and what you are interested in if you're using a regression model and you have stacked points this is always going to be a problem right because the way a regression model works in terms of prediction is you plug in the value of x and you get out a value of y that sits along the line so in this situation it appears like what we are always what we are going to get out each time we evaluate and actually we can just do it check So, okay, so if we let okay, we can go res one five plus res two five six. So 2.5316, yeah, this one is the intercept and then 12.396, 12 12.3869, 34. So that appears to be right around the average value. So I think under the assumption that the model fits well, we would just have to basically state like what we're gonna get out is the, roughly the average value of the four points, which is, fairly reasonable estimate. So we can say on average, these points are on average when X equals zero, the value of the points of Y are around 7.45, which actually seems pretty reasonable uh, given this data set. Seven and a half. Yeah, it's pretty close. Kind of cool. Yeah, and this one is 2.5. The mean of two and three is two and a half. And what's the mean of this will be right around 12? Yeah, 12.33. It's pretty cool. So the line is basically returning like the average value of the stacked points. It's kind of neat. I think that implies pretty good fit as well, actually. Sorry, boys, and I went off on a tangent there. Hopefully I gave you some sort of interpretation, <laughs> but I don't know. It's hard to define what best is. Um, any other questions? Okay. Okay, so the last thing I want to do is just show um, that we can also get a sense of how our um, our our IWLS function is working compared to the built-in R functions. So we're going to talk about the built-in R function and the output from those functions in more detail in the coming weeks because we're going to study the um, binomial GLM and the the different subsets of the binomial GLM. And then the Poisson GLM and the different subsets of the Poisson GLM in the um, in the weeks to come. But just as a little bit of a precursor, so we can use the GLM function to fit the exact same model that we had just fitted to that Poisson data. So here we're going to have y given x. So you can see that the GLM function it, it runs in the same way as the LM function. The only difference is then you specify the family. So it has a built-in number of families associated with it, which I think are pretty substantial. Right, so it has, uh, you have the binomial, 
you can actually do the Gaussian. So you can, we could compare the uh, GLM results from a Gaussian to the LM results, gamma, inverse gamma, Poisson. I'm not sure what quasi is. And then you have quasi binomial and quasi Poisson. Right, so these are the, all the different families that you can fit using the GLM function. And then you have a choice of link functions for each of the different families. And we're going to look at these in more detail later. But for example, for the binomial, you have logit, probit, and cochit. We'll talk about each of those. And you have the complementary log log. Uh, for the Poisson, you have the log and the identity functions and the square root function. For the inverse gamma, you have uh, inverse identity and log. So there's a lot of different comparisons that we can perform within each of the families. But again, I'll return to that as we're going to talk about each of these in more detail in a few weeks. But just for uh, confirmation purposes, we can check our results by using the GLM function on the same family. And then just like with the LM function, we can use summary. Okay, and then you can see the output. So this is very similar to regression output. It gives you the deviance residuals. We're going to talk about these in lecture. Um, and then it gives you estimates, standard errors, the Z score, right? Because we know that the, um, as we showed in class, these estimates are approximately normally distributed, so we can perform our hypothesis tests using uh, the, uh, the standard normal table. And these are essentially hypothesis tests for whether or not these values are significantly different from zero, which would be the same as with regression output. Anyway, so you can see here we have 7.4516 and 4.9353. And then from our results, 7.4516, 9.3. 4.9353, right? So the process for fitting uh, or for extracting these values is the same as for, it, it follows the same process that we just used for computing uh, the parameter estimates, right? So, and then it even tells us number of Fisher scoring iterations three, right? So you can see three iterations here, we converge to the same solution that is shown above. And we'll have to talk about AIC, null deviance, and residual deviance once we get there. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, any questions? Not seeing any. Okay, so um, that's all I had for today. I realize it's relatively short, but we have um, assignment number two is posted and it involves this type of um, calculation in question number four, I believe, except you have to re-derive the forms of X transpose WX and X transpose WZ because uh, it's using a log link. So you could, um, given the data setup, actually fit the GLM to the transform data as it's described in that lecture set and then confirm your output from your own IWLS to um, the output from the GLM function. Okay. So uh, with that, I will uh, stop recording for today and we can use the rest of this time as a working session. So I'll be here uh, to answer any questions that you might have about the assignment. And uh, tomorrow in lecture, we'll continue with lecture set number four and hopefully complete lecture set number four uh, leading into the weekend.